from Dallas, Texas, with the 43rd President of the United States, the author of Decision Points, George W. Bush, is with us on the Scott Hannon Show on the Common Sense Club. Mr. President, welcome. Thank you, Scott. I am delighted to see you, and I thank you for coming down here to what I affectionately call the promised land. It is indeed. It's a pleasure <laughs> to be here, and we appreciate you so much uh, having us and had a chance to visit with one of our one of our ag titans, Ron Offit, today. We talked about another friend of ours uh, Harold Ham, an oil titan today, so we had a nice chat before as well. And, we did. Uh, these are the people that make America go, aren't they? Well, they're the entrepreneurs that, are, uh, that create the jobs. What's interesting is in America, 70% of new jobs are created by small business owners. And um, in the book, I make it clear that I understood that, and my fiscal policy was aimed at you know, encouraging investment uh, and, um, and taking risk and creating jobs. You have so many decisions to cover in the book, and we did something a little unique here. We actually turned this all over to our listeners. Oh, great. Uh, we have, uh, I'm actually writing a book that uh, some fellow advisors of yours, uh, or former advisors, Mary Madeline and others, have helped me with, all about what I've, of people I've met along the way and, and how the grassroots of America is really changing America. So I'm, I'm a big believer in, in giving them a voice, and that's what we're doing here today. So I have just a couple of quick questions myself, and the rest of the, are their questions. And one has to do with, as I mentioned, uh, we have an ag, uh, ag friend along in, in Ron Offit. We have uh, an oil friend in Harold Hamm who's putting a ton in the energy sector right now. And I've spent a lot of time talking about how really energy can transform the economy big time. And we're seeing that in, in North Dakota. You're an oil man and obviously spent some time in the book talking about your decision about what business to go in and how to use that business degree. How do you think we can use energy policy in America to transform our economy and get it going again? Well, first of all, the key thing is to understand that technologies uh, make it easier to extract uh, natural resources here in our own country. So, for example, there is a significant oil and gas play in what heretofore were viewed as non-productive reservoirs, that be shale plays like the Bakken play there in North Dakota, the Barnett shale here in Texas, and other shale plays. And that Americans have got to understand it's in our interest to incent people to find hydrocarbons in our own country that makes us not only more economically secure but more nationally secure. Do you think that it ultimately could uh, – I've heard the figure that 25 percent of the economy, the economic loss in this country in 2008 came out of energy. Do you think if we had more sensible uh, you know, use of our resources, not unlike what we're doing in North Dakota, where we have, by the way, a surplus – that we could transform the economy with it? Well, I think, I think it's – I view it from a national security perspective. I mean, to be dependent upon sources of energy from parts of the world where people don't like us it puts us in a, 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 a position of weaker national security. And so I'm very encouraged by a lot of these natural gas and oil plays here that are taking place. The truth of the matter is, is that over time, our habits will change. For example, I do believe we're going to be driving electric cars one of these days, and that – Therefore, the question is, where do we get our electricity from? And it's going to continue to be a mix of coal and natural gas. But we also got to be wise about the use of nuclear power. One of the, I did a little analysis of the three most used words over the last, um, I don't know, three to three to four months here for sure, and they are Bush tax cuts. <laughs> it's, it's everywhere right now with this debate going on. You talk, obviously, about uh, the economic crisis and the financial crisis in your book, and it's obviously uh, right now a, a recognition of members of Congress of both sides that we need to keep your tax policy in place. Does that feel like a vindication? Well, I wish they'd have called it something other than the Bush tax cuts, and therefore there'd probably be less angst amongst some to pass it. But I do believe it's very important to send the signal to our entrepreneurs uh, and our families that the government trusts them to spend their own money. And I happen to believe lower taxes is what stimulates economic growth, and what we need now in the country is economic growth. A lot of uh, questions about different decisions, and uh, I want to go through some of these for, from the listeners. Uh, one uh, is, is wondering, saying, I always admired your self-restraint and not lashing out at those who have continued to pile on the criticism of some of your decisions and policies. I do wonder, however, if you would have been better served if you had at least on occasion defended yourself. I understand the concept of being presidential, and I admire you as a president who held a very high standard for the office of the president, but at some point, don't the gloves have to come off? Well, they certainly didn't when I was president, because I, and I was disappointed at times by some of the name-calling that took place. On the other hand, I didn't think it was good for the country for me, the president, to engage in the same name-calling. In terms of the post-presidency, there are plenty of defenders of me, but I don't think it's good for the country for me to be out there either defending myself or criticizing my successor. Another, uh, when speaking with people on the left concerning the importance of fiscal responsibility, it's hard for us as conservatives to defend the lack thereof by a Republican-controlled House, Senate, and White House. Do you have any regret over the amount of money that was spent during your time as president? 
Well, the most money that was spent during my time as president was on our military, and I have zero regret of making sure the men and women who have volunteered for our country in the face of danger had the full support of the government, nor do I have any regret making sure those who returned from theaters of combat had the best veterans' uh, 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 health care and or, or, or pay as possible as well. Uh, I, I would take exception uh, to the listener who said that our fiscal record wasn't sound. I think if you analyze it from an objective basis, uh, for uh, you, you'll find that the ability to cut taxes, grow the economy, and hold down spending other than national defense was a hallmark of my administration to the point where our debt-to-GDP ratio was as good as Ronald Reagan's was, and our deficit-to-GDP ratio, for example, was half of his. Um, I, I'm a believer in supply-side economics, and I think we proved that supply-side economics can work, albeit in a time of great uncertainty about whether our nation was safe or not. Speaking of uh, the financial crisis, as you do quite eloquently in the book and all the decisions around that, the Federal Reserve obviously had an important role. And we had a question from Jerry and Moorhead about that, asking, what do you think President Andrew Jackson, if alive, would think and do about the Federal Reserve Bank today, noting that he, uh, he annulled its charter in his day? Yeah, well, I, I've studied Jackson's policies, and he was a, a very fine president. My judgment is, is that the Federal Reserve is necessary, and it ought to be independent from politics. We don't want the legislative body affecting monetary policy. In other words, the legislative body and the president work together on fiscal policy. But I do think it's very important to have an independent uh, group of people that affect our monetary policy. I'm a, I'm a believer in Ben Bernanke. I trusted him to the point where I nominated him to become chairman of the Federal Reserve, and uh, I, I trust him today. Mary in Walcott, North Dakota, you won't remember this, but she was on stage with you one time when you came out to, to kick off the effort to do Social Security reform, said uh, the following. Was there ever a time that you compromised your values to make a decision? She talked about decision-making being the hardest thing we do in our lives. I can't imagine how difficult it must be to make the best decisions for an entire country. I know you are a man of personal values. Was there ever a time that you compromised those values to make a decision? Uh Really not, except for the financial meltdown. In other words, I wasn't going to compromise by my belief in the universality of freedom or my belief that all life was precious or my belief that uh, we ought to trust people to spend their own money. Uh, but when it came to the financial crisis, my, my, my philosophy was that if you make a bad mistake in the marketplace, you ought to fail. The problem was is that the situation was so acute that I was worried if we started to let financial firms fail, the country could spiral into a bankruptcy. And a, it was painful, frankly, to spend people's money on Wall Street, the people who helped perpetuate the crisis, to prevent Main Street from suffering. And so to a certain extent, I did compromise a principle there. And uh, on the other hand, if I had to do it over again, I would have made the same decision. I don't think you can be president and gamble with people's lives um, in a situation like uh, we found ourselves. In other words, I could have said let them fail, but the danger is that we could have spiral into a depression. And uh, uh, I don't think a president can take that kind of gamble with people's lives. 